You know what I was about to say, as promised? I say it every time. Every time I have a guest, I say, as promised, we've got Mike Golick Jr. Look, we just have Mike Golick. I know I told you it'd be, but I'm not going to tell you as promised. I'm a big fan. One of my favorite people in media, period, for a bunch of different reasons. Um, having met him, his show, having been on his show. By the way, I've gotten multiple emails, I think, Mike, of people that listen to the Ross Tucker football podcast that say they first heard me on Gojo show. Is that true or do you tell people to do that? Oh, I absolutely tell people to do that. And depending on who you are, I will pay you to do that because then it's going to make everyone want to keep coming on my podcast. But listen, apparently people liked it so much. That means one, we'll have to have you back again soon. But two, they're getting the beauty and the joy of now getting to listen to the Ross Tucker football podcast if they weren't already. I love it. Um, how is the show going? Man? How long has it been now? So it'll be a year May 7th. That was when we first launched. So we're just inside a year right now. And man, I know you, you know, we've talked about it. You were the brick and mortar that helped build DraftKings and all the content that we've added now. You've been here watching all of this. It's been a whirlwind of a year. It's felt long and short at the same time. It's like training camp, man. Every day has been, hey, let's get through the five minutes in front of our face. But we've had a blast doing it. It's been a lot of fun doing it with Brandon. So it's uh, it's crazy that we're only getting up on a year and also that it's already been a year. So I would encourage people, number one, to follow Mike on social media, at Mike Golick Jr., and definitely – Follow at Gojo Show. You guys do a great job with that account. Funny stuff, you know, the Gojo out of context show quotes. You really do do a good job. <laughs> Wait, and that guy's not actually on the payroll for us either, by the way. That's just an awesome fan who decided to start throwing those up there. So shout out to Out of Context Gojo for helping us promote the show. Truly doing the Lord's work. That is amazing. Um, here's how I would describe the show or describe Mike. He's like a younger, cooler me, and his show's an hour every day, but it's not just football like mine is. Mike actually cares about and watches the other sports and talks about them. So uh, you, sh- you guys should all check it out. That's, that's, that's the last one. That's, the last, that's three in a row to start, to start the interview. Three plugs. That's the last one. Um, check them out. I, I really have three main things for you, Mike. Um the first one, since we're, you know, we got the draft, uh, we're in draft time right now. I never really asked you, and I think this is a really cool topic because everybody has a story. Everybody has a draft story. What was yours? Like, did you think you were going to get drafted? Did you know you were a free agent? Like, give me give me kind of the uh, the Golic Jr. rundown. Take, what was it, 2012 or 13 yep. maybe? 2013 NFL draft coming off that 2012 season. And yeah, I listen, I was a late 10 year boomer. anniversary. I, who could ever forget sitting on my couch in South Bend with my parents in a, um, so this will, this will be great. So I knew I was going to be probably an undrafted guy in the lead up. My agent had kind of said, yeah, there's a couple teams that maybe could take a late round flyer on you, but more often than not going to be undrafted. And I knew that I was a late bloomer. I ended up starting 17 games at Notre Dame. The only full season was my last year where I got lucky. We went 12 and 0. things were good. So there was a lot more attention helps my chances. The rising tide lifts all ships. And so I go through and I had a couple of teams reach out to me during the course of the draft. But really, that weekend for me was getting to enjoy watching a lot of my buddies that were going to be drafted highly, drafted in the first couple of rounds. Tyler Eifert was a first-rounder in that draft class, some of the other guys. And so getting to watch that, knowing, hey, my time's going to be later on here. I got to do it with my family. We were all in South Bend. They still have a place out there. And, you know, just sat around. And that day I got, uh, you know, a call from Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs about coming in and doing the training camp tryout with them. I got the call from the Pittsburgh Steelers to sign there as a priority undrafted free agent. And I ended up making that move. And it was, you know, it was exciting. And for me, I think because I was so lucky in having my father as someone I looked up to, but also as like a resource for all this, I knew that while this is the next step in the process. And it's a celebration for a lot of people, especially the guys that are drafted highly, who are going to make the money that changes their lives. I always knew the route I was probably going to go was just, 
hey, now the work really begins. Now you got to try and scratch and claw to even make it to the next part of this that you want to get to. And so it was great to have the next direction for where I was going. But I really knew at that point that it was about getting started with the work. And that was the exciting portion. Um, okay. So you knew you were going to be undrafted and Andy Reed, did it, did literally Andy Reed call you? Yeah, that was one. Cause I mean, especially Andy had been so close with dad for years that, you know, he, he, he had known us, he had known me through, you know, through dad. And so that one, you know, was, was cool. And obviously incredibly, you know, it, it's not, it's inspiring is not the right word, but certainly like heartening that like, all right, like that's a pretty cool moment there to know that ass came, but it was a tryout and the Steelers were going to actually sign you. Exactly. Which is also the difference. Like, you know, the Steelers were actually going to kick like a few grand of signing bonus money in there too, which is always a nice little thing as they sit around, as you know, when they introduce you at a lot of those rookie camps and have you do the stand up, it's always stand up. What school did you go to? And what was your signing bonus? And so to actually get to say a number and have it, you know, not just be nothing was a nice way to start that introduction, even if it didn't ultimately work out. You know what's funny about that, Mike? Um, I got zero signing bonus. And my roommate for the rookie mini camp the weekend after the draft, I think his name was Brad Harms, Northern Iowa. His signing bonus was 5000 And he had his check in our hotel room. I remember this vividly. And he was like, man, these taxes are the worst. Uh, aren't they? And I was like, yeah, yeah, terrible. Taxes, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and then, by the way, two other quick things about that, Mike. I've never heard anybody snore so loud in my life. Oh. I went down to the front desk and I said, listen, tomorrow's the single most important day of my life. And I have not slept one second yet. It's 1 a.m. I need You need to put me in another room. Now, I don't know if the Redskins got the bill for that or what, but they put me in another room. And then um, Brad got cut like after minicamp. And I, it was clear that I was way better than him. And it was clear I was better than several of the guys. And I remember saying to my agent, like, hey, can I get the five grand that they gave that guy? Ah. I'm better than him. Like, <laughs> a five grand, like, when you're 22, I'm calculating how many kegs of yingling I can get for $5,000. So that's funny. So it's funny, Mike. I'm – Halfway through the second uh, episode of the Manti Teo doc, mm. um, we have two kids, so like we never watch TV, but I know I'm in it, and people are like, so I, I, I gotta watch it because I'm in it for like eight seconds or something. But that was your senior year. Yep. I yeah, mean, <laughs> I, I'm sure you get asked about it a lot. I'm sure you have like a stock answer, but like, what was it like? Like, what what did you like? When did you guys know something was weird or off? Like, what's the deal there? Yeah, so it's interesting because, one, you're right. The documentary coming out was just an excuse for us to all look for ourselves in the background of this. And it was cool to see people that I worked with. Michael Eaves was doing one of the dinners that Manti was at for the award circuit he was on at the end of the year. So it was popping up left and right, you know, the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen meme. But um, we didn't find out about what had actually happened until well after the season. So I was playing, and it was the Raycom Stars and Stripes game. It was, you know, the third level down of the Senior Bowl and the Shrine Bowl and the NFLPA Bowl and all that stuff. And me and Robbie Toma, who was a wideout for us and had been high school best friends and high school teammates with Manti at Punao in Hawaii, I was with him that week, and it breaks. And as you can imagine – the SEC players that were already inclined to make fun of us for getting stomped out by Bama in that title game that had just happened recently were also getting their jokes off at our expense. Like, oh, y'all don't have real girls at school up there. What's this about? And so that was when it broke for me. During the season, we had always known that relationship was, you know, kind of a weird distance thing. And when you're the star player on a team, people are like, why? I don't know why you wouldn't just date somebody here, but you know, that's not my thing. Me and Manti weren't super close as, as teammates. And so it was one of those, all right, we knew he had been dating this girl. We knew it had been long distance. I think they had, you know, claimed to have met at Stanford the year before, which I remember 
But when it went down and we got the news that Lene had quote unquote died, it was also in the same day that Manti had actually lost his grandmother. And so we were getting ready to play Michigan or Michigan State at the beginning of the season. And Coach Kelly brings us all up and says, hey, Manti's, you know, ha- had a rough go here. He wanted to talk to you guys and just get you up to date. And Manti told us, he's like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm going through it right now. I just lost my grandmother. I just lost my girl. Like, you know, I- I'm going to still be here with you guys this week. And we did what we had done for all of our other teammates, unfortunately, who had dealt with losses in their family, losing parents, losing loved ones. Wrap your arms around him. Try and be there for him in whatever capacity you normally are around the locker room. And then understand and know that guys like Robbie and his other close friends were going to be the ones that really had to shoulder the bulk of that load. But as the season went along and that story got bigger and bigger because Manti's an off-ball linebacker with seven interceptions, with you, which you know doesn't happen all that often, ends up being the second runner-up for the Heisman. We have the best season in Notre Dame football since the Brady Quinn era and are undefeated going into that title game. When all these things start to happen, there's a ton of attention on him. But as you know, Ross, like for the rest of us, we're trying to keep our heads above water. This is my first year as a week one starter going through the season, and we've got all this extra added attention. There's all this pressure on us, the game. So I'm just trying to figure out what I need to do day to day to go through it. It's so myopic, as you know, that for the rest of that season, we knew people were talking about it, but it wasn't this thing that was hanging over the locker room or talked about every day for us. We were trying to figure out what we needed to do to beat Purdue and Stanford and all these different teams we were going to play. That that makes perfect sense. People are always so surprised when you tell them stuff like that. Like, uh, like what happens when this guy got in trouble? I'm like, I didn't care at all. It didn't affect me or my life or my job. Um, I got two more things for you, Mike, that I got to get to when we return. All right, so here's the two things I have for you, Mike. Number one, I got to ask you, you went to a Taylor Swift concert. Like, I didn't know until I started following you on social media that you're a big Taylor Swift guy. I don't Have we talked about this? You know she's from my hometown, right? I did not know that, actually. Wow, what a blessing. Oh, yeah, yeah. She's from Why Missing. I'm, like, pretty good friends with her dad. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Whoa, okay. We really need to talk about this then. <laughs> no, 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 no. We're not. But I will say, like, so um, people sometimes bust my chops about being a big fan of hers. But, like, I guess I kind of have a reason, right? Like, it's a small hometown, an hour west of Philly. Um, I'll just tell you one quick thing, Mike. I went to her concert maybe, like, 2016 in Nashville. And I was talking to her mom and I said how from 2001, my rookie year to like 2008, I was the most famous person probably ever from why missing. (laughs) And I told her mom, I'm like, until Taylor came along and her mom said to me, Mike, she said, uh, well, you know, Ross, just keep working. I was like, uh, no, I think it's over. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she's 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 like the most famous person in the world i'm gonna go ahead right now mrs swift and like take the l on that one i'm gonna i'm gonna declare that i take the l so anyway um i legitimately think her music's fantastic i am sure because i only remember like two things i learned in college right um at princeton one was always consider the source and the inherent bias they might have And I'm quite sure because I've met her multiple times and I've been on her tour bus or whatever, her RV, like I'm quite sure. And she's, I'm quite sure I'm biased, but um, anyway, I want to hear why you like her so much. Cause that, that it intrigues me that a male football player in his early thirties is as outspoken as you are. Mine is obvious. Yours is like, there's no connection. You just really enjoy it. Right. Ross, let me just say this. We're going to offline about this connection because if you've actually met her parents and been on her tour bus, we got to talk because you are now my goal. I want to be Ross Tucker even more when I grow up because you have been inside the inner circle. For me, it's purely because I think she makes good music. Like, So for me, her album Red, which is considered one of her two best, came out when I was in college. And so I remember being out of bars and hearing songs like 22 and that piping through the stereo. It was the songs that we had fun and party to. And then it just kind of grew from there. I mean, she's my exact age. So she was born in 1989. We're both 33. And so I've kind of seen, all right, the content always sort of mirrors where we're at in life. It sounds really good. She knows how to make hits. And 
she puts on an incredible show, and that's all I had ever seen. This was the first time when I went and saw her most recent tour, the one she's on now, the Eras Tour in Las Vegas. It was the first show of hers that I had ever seen. And so, yeah, it just sort of built over time. It, Ross, the, the way I've always operated is like, I, I don't really care what people are going to like think or say or judge off what I enjoy listening. Like, I know people are going to typecast me. I'm a 6'4", bald, bearding, white guy covered in tattoos. I look like I should be into one very specific lane of things. And I've always kind of prided myself on the fact that because of that, it's even funnier when people find out all the stuff I'm into. The fact that, like, I love Taylor Swift. I'm really into Japanese anime. I watch a lot of real trash reality TV shows. Like, I do all these things that someone that looks like me normally doesn't do. And I actually take a lot of joy in that. So, yeah, I... I, I, the biggest thing I take joy in Ross is I took my younger brother to the Taylor Swift concert. We was with my whole family. He was the least Taylor Swift fan of all of us. And by the time we were done, he had downloaded everything onto his phone. He was listening to Taylor Swift when he picked me up from the airport the next week. We full on converted him through the experience. That's amazing. Yeah. Her shows are incredible. I've been to three, like, I'll give you one quick one, Mike. I went to her show right after the Tim McGraw song came out, like yeah. in 2006, maybe, or seven. Um, I went to her show in our hometown, like at the local theater. She had just gotten popular, and she sings this song about Corey's eyes. Corey's eyes. I know Corey. Corey was the quarterback of the high school football team. No. <laughs> oh, my so God. Then after the show, I see Corey walking out. And I'm like, yo, Corey, come here. And he comes over to my wife. And I'm like, Kara, this is Corey. She's like, Corey who? I'm like, like, Corey's eyes. Like, Corey, the song, Corey's eyes. And and she's like, well, you do have nice eyes. It was just funny. Really, really funny. Oh, my God. Um, I had no idea you were this tied into the Taylor Swift universe, Ross. This is incredible. Yeah, we got to have a whole conversation sometime. <laughs> she puts on a great show. Um, I'm a huge fan. I heard she's doing like 40 songs or something insane. It's 44 songs, three hours and 15 minutes of concert time. And she's going to do 53 of these, Ross. It's insane. Yeah, that's nuts. Um, all right. My last question. Is not, there's no good segue. <laughs> but my last question, you like are studying draft prospects, right? Yeah. Okay. Why? Like, tell me about your draft process like how many guys do you study is it just the linemen and for, is, is there a specific purpose to it so actually yeah this is a, a great time so me myself my dad charlotte wilder and a bunch of other folks at DraftKings are going to be doing a draft live stream night one of the draft so people are going to be able to check that out on all the DraftKings social channels on the DraftKings youtube feed but we're going to go to boston and we're going to do a little draft show on night one and so for me, it's actually been good. Like I got in the habit of it when I was at ESPN. I used to be part of a lot of their digital productions there. And one of the shows that I was a part of at the very beginning was our draft show. And we would do all three, all three days streaming. So as you know, no commercials built into that. When you get to day three and it's seven hours of draft and prospects that most people haven't heard of, you, one, are so deep in the weeds in what you're studying that it'll make your head spin. And two, largely BSing about other stuff and large storylines. And so for me this year, it's a lot easier because it's just round one. So I'm getting to focus on just the prospects we're going to see that day, the top you know, 40 or 50 guys that could potentially go in round one. Like you said, I lean a lot on the linemen because those are who I have the most fun watching. Like The one thing the draft process teaches me, Ross, I don't know how people enjoy scouting positions that are offensive and defensive line. Like there's whole plays for receivers and DBs where just nothing happens. They throw the ball the other way. You don't have to come up and tackle like at least O and D line. Something happens every play and it's a high speed collision. And I just don't know how people enjoy studying those other positions as much as you would enjoy watching the big boys go to work inside. Mike, this always sounds weird when I say this to you. Because I'm only 10 years older, but I met you when you were like 18 or something. You are excellent, man. Like your your delivery, I mean, you used a couple fancy words, uh, <laughs> myopic. I knew what that one was. I'm just always impressed when I talk with you. Follow this man at Gojo Show is the podcast at Mike Golick Jr. Thanks so much for coming on again. Really appreciate it. Tell Corey I said hi. Thanks, Ross. <laughs>